Edmonton Strathcona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as my colleague before me said, thank you very much for affording me this opportunity. Um, Mr. Speaker, I put a question to uh, the Minister of Transport um, some days back, and the concern was with the growing concern with um, rail disasters and the failure of this government to assert its powers to intervene and prevent these incidents. Uh, great concern that over, apparently reportedly, over 3,000 percent increase in dangerous rail traffic. The Minister responded, Mr. Speaker, by saying that uh, the health and safety of Canadians was the top priority, and then cited um, a statement uh, by the President of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities endorsing the actions taken by the government. Mr. Speaker, I think it's really important here to clarify that indeed, as I understand, uh, the President of the Federation of Communities did thank the uh, Minister for suggesting that they would increase, require increased insurance in the case of disasters. But in, in fact, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities have called for preventative action to prevent further incidents, not simply action after the fact. And in fact, have called for three specific measures, equipping and supporting municipal first responders to rail emergencies, mm -hmm. ensuring federal uh, and industry policies and regulations address rail safety, and third, preventing the downloading of rail safety emergency response costs to local taxpayers. Uh, in fairness, they did uh, say that they look forward to working with the Minister of Transport to deliver concrete reforms, which they are still awaiting. Uh, Mr. Speaker, what deeply troubles uh, Canadians is sadly the response by this government to tragedies such as Lac Megantic and additional ra rail disasters is seriously inadequate. Uh, the situation in Canada is that the federal government has unilateral jurisdiction over rail, and therefore Canadians wait for them to take action. They can't turn to their provincial jurisdictions. And the focus has been only on after the effect instead of prevention. For example, uh, measures to deal with insurance after the fact if there's a serious incident. Uh, what communities are calling for is preventative action. And, uh, the rail workers indeed are calling for an end to railway self-regulation. They want the government to assert its power to regulate dangerous shipping, to prevent loss of life, and to prevent damage to the environment. Mr. Speaker, if I can just raise several recent major incidents. Um, at Lake Wabam in Alberta in 2005, a CN derailment spilled 700,000 cubic liters of bunker sea oil and a large portion of coal oil into Lake Wabam. Uh, the important recreational lake was closed to swimming, boating, and fishing for an entire year. It was the largest uh, spill into fresh water in North American history. Absolutely abject response by the federal government to that, and uh, they didn't show up until a week later to assist the First Nations, who were badly damaged their lands. The Chequemus disaster a few days later in British Columbia spilled 40,000 liters of sodium hydroxide, killing the fishery that had just recovered. And in my own riding into the heart of the community, daily tanker cars of hazardous chemicals come through. And now I've heard recently about dangers of a CN burned out bridge in Slave Lake. So my question, Mr. Speaker, would be, when can we expect that this government will actually take preventative action, assert their regulatory powers, and actually protect Canadian communities and our environment? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Transport. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Our government has taken concrete actions to enhance the safety of the Canadian rail system, making it one of the safest in the world. Transport Canada must constantly review incidents with a view of enhancing safety. That is why the work of the Transportation Safety Board is so important. Uh, the Transportation Safety Board is investigating the Gainford incident, for example, and the Department will not hesitate to take appropriate safety actions from any identified safety deficiency brought forward to the Department. In 2007, our government conducted a full review of the Railway Safety Act. The independent review panel made recommendations to improve rail safety after national consultations with key stakeholders. Transport Canada agreed with all of those recommendations and have been taking action to address them. Our government 
amended the Railway Safety Act to further improve safety by providing new authorities for improved oversight and enforcement. One of the amendments requires railways to get a safety-based railway operating certificate before they begin operations. Another amendment allows us to implement administrative monetary penalties as a new tool for dealing with companies that do not meet safety regulations requirements. The tragedy at Lac Megantic and the derailment in Gainford highlighted the importance in continuing to work together to keep such incidents from happening. This government has made further concrete efforts to enhance the safety of rail and the movement of dangerous goods. On July 23rd, Transport Canada issued an emergency directive to railway companies requiring, first, that two operators at all time for trains carrying dangerous goods. Second, no trains transporting dangerous goods to be left unattended. Third, all cabins must be locked. Four, all reversers removed from locomotives. And fifth, ensure that all brakes are properly applied on all locomotives. The department also issued a ministerial order obligating railway companies to develop rules to comply with these requirements permanently. In the aftermath of these events, the minister has also spoken with many groups to determine how they could strengthen railway safety standards. Transport Canada will continue to cooperate and work with industry and communities to identify further measures to improve safety for all Canadians. The approach has been warmly accepted and lauded by such groups as the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. To emphasize the importance of transportation safety, a speech from the throne noted two important actions. First, that shippers and railway companies would be required to carry additional insurance so they are held accountable. And second, Transport Canada would take targeted action to make the transportation of dangerous goods safer. On the second point, the Department issued a protective direction in October requiring parties who import or offer for transport crude oil must retest the classification of crude oil if that classification test has not been conducted since July 7, 2013. They must also make those test results available to Transport Canada and update their safety data sheets and provide them to Transport Canada's Canadian Transport Emergency Centre. And finally, until such testing is completed, they must also ship all crude oil as Class 3 flammable liquid packing Group 1 when shipping by rail. In short, we're continuing to take action to improve Canada's rail safety system. Since the 2007 Review of Railway Safety Act, train accidents have actually decreased. The Department's continued actions will continue to reduce the risk of accidents, enhance competitiveness of our nation's railways, and increase the public safety of Canadians. Transport Canada remains dedicated to keeping Canada's transportation system safe and secure, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Edmonton Strathcona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm afraid to have to reiterate again. Um, we appreciate that the government has taken some actions. Regrettably, it is by and large after the fact. Um, more than half a dozen measures that the Transportation Safety Board had directed should occur two decades back have still not occurred. I don't have time to limit all of them, but I encourage the government to go back and look at the many reports of Transportation Safety Board done after the fact. What Canadian communities are calling for is this government to use its regulatory powers. Why regulatory powers and not emergency orders? Because regulations require that there actually be consultation with the communities that are impacted. And so what Canadians, including the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, are calling for is that the government actually assert its regulatory powers, consult with the municipalities, and come forward with a concerted regulatory agenda to avoid these serious accidents into the future. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Well, Mr. Speaker, our government believes that a strong preventative safety program is one built around compliance with appropriate regulations. That is why our government has taken concrete measures to enhance the safety of rail and the transportation of dangerous goods uh, so that accidents such as the one in Gainford and the tragedy at Lac Megantic are not repeated. After Lac Megantic, our government issued an emergency directive to immediately enhance the safety of rail transportation, followed by a ministerial order requiring industry to develop rules to make those measures permanent. 
The Department issued a protective direction requiring a person who imports or offers for transport to retest the classification of their crude oil prior to transport. We are working closely with industry, with first responders and communities to identify additional measures to enhance the safety of rail transportation and the transportation of dangerous goods. It should also be noted since the Comprehensive Railway Safety Act review in 2007, we have taken decisive action to reduce the possibility of accidents and derailments in the rail industry. In fact, since that review, there has been a marked decline in rail accidents. That is our uh, result of our commitment to improving rail safety, Mr. Speaker.